Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Mrs. Starks, a 58-year-old lady, has been referred to us uh, with regard to a problem on the left mandible. And I'm going to talk with uh, her in just a moment and, and learn a little bit more uh, along with you about the problem for which she seeks consultation. Mrs. Starks, let me ask you a question about that lesion on the side. And we'll call it a lesion because that just means any lump, bump, or something right. that we don't know. How long have you known that's been there? Approximately two months. About two months. Mm -hmm. What first called it to your attention? Well, it was the uh, imprint and soreness of uh, the partial that I wear. I see. So the partial sh didn't fit is what right. it amounts to. It began to be progressively more of a problem, and so you went to the yeah. dentist. Is that right, right about this? Right, because there was a swelling there. Then it became a sore area that I could not... Uh, keep my partial in for eating purposes and it was very uncomfortable otherwise anyway the swelling became more and more so that was when I went to my dentist. I see and, and what did he do? He uh, eliminated the length of the partial in that area for me, adjusted it and shortened it. And that felt better? Oh definitely, right? yeah. And then did it uh, just stay that way or? Uh... Well <clears throat> I can eat um, and uh, wear it, but it still makes me uncomfortable because of my pains that I have in the area of my jaw and of the um, pricking and hot feeling sensation in my chin area, which I is see. also numb. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've described then that you went to the dentist because of, of a lump that was growing and this made the denture not fit too well. Right. And there was also some pain associated. The, the dentist then reduced the size of the partial and the pain uh, seemed to go away a little bit and the dentures yeah. seemed to fit better. Oh yeah. Has the, has the pain come back, however, and is the denture once again having difficulty in fit? Uh, it seems to be now to the extent that it's crowding the two teeth that I had uh, recently refilled because of the filling coming out. But um, <clears throat> otherwise it's fitting good that uh, I can't eat until I have this uh, actual pain in my jaw area. All right, so you have pain. Let me ask you a couple questions about mm -hmm. the pain. Um, how does it feel? Is it a sharp, jabbing, lancinating pain or a burning, smoldering pain? D can you describe it's, it to uh, me? <clears throat> just like someone, <clears throat> pardon me, just like someone has been to the dentist and had um, work done, like uh, medication for removing a tooth or a filling being done or applied, that all the feeling comes back into your mouth area, you know how this yeah, feels. Yeah, so it begins to prickly, wake up. Prickly and hot, and sometimes I have extreme shooting pains from one area at a time, all and right. that is in this area only. Of course now, back in this part, uh, my, my mouth is very sensitive, my face is very sensitive in all this area. All right. Very much so. Why don't you show us uh, by pointing to your teeth? You've described the teeth are a little numb. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, show us the, the numb teeth? Well, from this area. Let's see, put your head right back here, if you would. Right, right there. So you're pointing right between the central incisors, and all on the uh -huh. left side then uh -huh. are numb. Right. How about the lip? This lip area from here and my on down my chin area, all the way back. All right. It's numb. Even though I brush my teeth, I know not whether I'm doing it or not. I see. I've had dental work done on my teeth and needed no medication of any kind. The doctor or the dentist couldn't understand why I was able to stand such, uh, you know, a problem being so serious in such a deep cavity without medication. I told him I didn't feel a thing, which I did. Beautiful. Didn't. Mm -hmm. All right, fine. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look <coughs> and, and see what it is that uh, uh, the dentist observed and what it is that uh, Mrs. Starks brings to us to examine. So we'll first look at the contour of your face, Mrs. Starks. Let me turn you around just like mm -hmm. this. Good. Just like that, front on. And the asymmetry which you describe where the, 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 the facial contour is not terribly prominent just looking at you like that. On the other hand, if I put my fingers over here and begin to feel 
I can begin to feel that the mandible, particularly at the inferior border, has a little bit of a, uh, a distension. That is, it bulges downward. There is a smooth, sessile enlargement of the inferior border, beginning at about the ramus and moving anteriorly to about the old oh, first bicuspid area, perhaps. And there, the inferior border feels pretty normal. Now let me look inside the mouth, if I may, for a minute. Mm -hmm. We'll put a retractor in here to see if we can display the features. And I'll put a tongue blade back here, too. First of all, there is no ulcer, no break in continuity of the surface mucosa. And as I look in here, it's smooth, and the color is pink and normal. And you're doing just fine there, because I'm certainly pushing the tongue way to the side. But right at the end of the tongue blade, uh, you can begin to see how there is a sessile enlargement of the mandible in the area of the angle and ascending ramus, which uh, uh, can be felt much better than it can be uh, uh, displayed. And this is where I think, Ms. Stark, the, the dentist has to <coughs> learn to use his fingers, because do you remember when first I examined you? Let's mm -hmm. tip you back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Open wide now. I put my finger in here and began to feel. Mm -hmm. Now the the enlargement that I feel begins right about this area. If the uh, camera can begin to creep in here, you can see that I really am anterior to what would normally be the ascending ramus, and yet the lump is present in this area. Yes, that's a very nice display. So that we have really a fairly large swelling, even though it does not display too well. It probably extends between my two fingers one in the lingual, one out here in the buckle, all the way in between probably is uh, a lesion which is causing expansion of the mandible. It is bony hard, smooth, and the patient does not wince as I squeeze at it. And I think that pretty much then tells us from the clinical <coughs> point of view those features that uh, we'd like to see. Uh, next, we will go to the x-rays. The x-rays will help us to define the location and extent of the lesion. You can see that we'll use the posterior anterior view and the two lateral jaws to locate uh, both the location and extent. Let's focus first on the left lateral jaw. An examination of this film will help us to define whether the lesion has destroyed bone and produces a lytic lesion, or whether it is building bone and is a sclerotic lesion, or whether both processes are going on simultaneously. If that is the case, then we will see an abnormality in the spiculation of the area. Looking at the left mandible, one discovers that there are areas of darkness and lightness, or bone destruction and bone manufacturing. Additionally, as one follows the uh, superior uh, line of the body, there is a little bulge in this area that tends to be somewhat sclerotic. Osseous abnormality probably extends from in this area all the way anterior up to about in here. Now let's contrast that with the opposite side to make sure that we're not looking at simply anomalies in this lady's jaw. It is quite dark and difficult to see, but the superior border is fairly smooth. The inferior border is also quite smooth, and trabeculation tends to be uniform in this mandible. Let's uh, move up to the anteroposterior view. Comparison of right and left sides is perhaps easier done in this single view when one compares the left side with the right. The trabeculation has been lost in the area in question on the affected side, whereas the trabeculation on the normal side is as we would expect. The process extends up superiorly to about this level, and the lesion extends down here and occupies the entire body of the mandible up to probably this area. So from these two views, we have determined the extent of the lesion in its superior, inferior 
aspect, as well as from its uh, uh, buccal lingual uh, aspect as well. The Panorex film can also be used very nicely to compare right with left sides. As is apparent here, the affected side is much more sclerotic than is the right side. Additionally, on the affected side, we can examine some of the uh, features. For example, there seems to be sphericals coalescing one with another of sclerotic bone. Let's go to the normal side for comparison. And here one can see the uniform trabeculation one would expect to see in an edentulous jaw. Let's look at the lower x-ray which also is a Panorex view, but uh, taken nine days later. The film that you just saw was the film taken the same day that we saw Mrs. Starks, and nine days have now elapsed, and you're looking at an additional film which displays the growth of the process. If one looks at the affected jaw now, you can uh, see a much more extreme uh, destruction of bone and production of bone, rather distinct lytic cavities now appearing. The angle of the mandible seems to be involved and the process seems to extend superiorly up almost to the condyle, just below the notch, and up into the coronoid. Proper management requires accurate diagnosis. Accurate diagnosis depends in turn upon a proper clinical history, the accurate identification of the clinical features, examination of the radiographs, and ultimately, if required, microscopic tissue specimen, specimen analysis. This patient presents one significant feature in her history that we haven't made known to you up till now. It seems three years ago she had carcinoma of the cervix. So putting all the features together then, we face a possible three diagnoses. One of them, of course, is cancer. This is based upon the clinical features of anesthesia and pain in the area, and uh, further solidified, perhaps, by the establishing through the history of previous experience with carcinoma elsewhere in the body. Incorporating this with the radiographic features of destruction and building of bone, this would suggest, uh, in addition to carcinoma, osteomyelitis or infection of the jawbone producing the swelling that we saw clinically. Now recalling that uh, the most common cancer of the jaw is squamous cell carcinoma, accounting for approximately 93% of all cancers of the mouth. Squamous cell carcinoma usually has ulceration, and this lesion does not. Therefore, it must be one of the rare primary lesions or else a metastatic lesion based upon the clinical features. The x-ray diagnosis suggests either an osteosarcoma, which is a cancer that builds and destroys bone, or infection of the bone, osteomyelitis. The metastatic neoplastic process from the cervix is ruled out by the manufacturing of bone in the uh, x-ray. Let's then examine the microscopic features of this lesion to confirm a definitive diagnosis. With low power, let's examine the features of an excised sample. Bone, newly manufactured, is apparent. Following to the other edge of the specimen, the new bone seems to change its characteristics to a very cellular area. What appears to be muscle bundles are evident at the periphery. So here then are the extra osseous soft tissues, muscle. In this area we have periosteum. Below it, newly manufactured 
or primitive, primary, unreorganized bone. One of the alarming features, which we will see, is that as we cross the periosteum, we discover bone newly produced lying in an extra osseous location. Let's examine this bone under higher power. Higher power reveals the bone more clearly. Here we can see that the bone is not very sharply defined at the periphery, seeming to fade into the fibrous stroma. This resembles metaplastic or tumor bone. Blood vessels are clearly seen, and osteoclasts, uh, as well as osteocytes and osteoblasts, are visible. Moving around the specimen, somewhat similar features are seen throughout. If we reverse directions, go toward the periphery and the periosteum, cellularity increases and osseous component decreases until at this area, which should be the periosteum, a rather uh, dense cellular area is apparent. We'll go to a higher power and examine some of these nuclei closer. In addition to the bone that was seen earlier, we now see some disparity in the size and staining features of the nuclei of the cells, particularly down at the lower right hand or lower left hand corner, a large tadpole like cell is visible, which can be contrasted with a number of other nuclei of much, much smaller diameters elsewhere in this field. Let's move to another area. The hypercellularity is conspicuous here, and the new bone production is also. In addition to the nuclear abnormalities, this bone is being formed external to the periosteum, an ominous feature. These microscopic features, in addition to the clinical, historical, and radiographic evidence, confirms the diagnosis of osteosarcoma. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.